This video is sponsored by Brilliant. If you click this video, you probably already know that the dot product of two vectors can be found by multiplying the magnitudes of those vectors together and then multiplying by cosine of the angle between them. If you have the vectors written in component form, then you multiply the x components and the y components and then add the results, at least for two dimensions, and you get that same value. One way to think about this numerical value you get after doing the dot product is it's a measure of how similar the two vectors are. Well, this is more accurate to say when each vector has a length of one. If we say these are both unit vectors right now, then the dot product would be one, since the angle between them is zero. When the angle is 90, then the dot product is zero. And when the vectors point in opposite directions, the dot product is negative one. So for unit vectors, the dot product can be thought of as a measure of how similar the vectors are on a scale of negative one to one. So now where in the real world would we care about any of this? Well, one simple example would be what you're seeing here with solar panels. If you draw a unit normal vector that is coming directly off a solar panel, and another pointing directly at the sun, how similar those vectors are, or their dot product, would be a factor in how much solar energy is absorbed, since the more the solar panels are directly pointing at the sun, the more energy you get. Or another simple application, which is probably the first for a lot of us, is with work done by some force. If you pull a block or wagon or something at an angle along a frictionless surface, so long as you don't pull too hard, that object will slide along the floor in the direction of D. And the closer that force vector is to the direction of motion, the larger a change in kinetic energy you get over some distance. And this can be seen in the equation for change in kinetic energy being force dot distance. And since these aren't necessarily unit vectors now, it's not only about the angle between them, but also their magnitudes. If the force applied to the box or the distance you pulled it were to increase, then so would the change in kinetic energy. But now let's see some lesser known applications of the dot product, starting with video games. Vectors and linear algebra are huge in video game design, as vectors that are stored in the game can contain information on the velocities and relative positions of certain characters, for example. One use of this is determining whether one character is in another's field of view. Like, how should the game determine whether a guard sees you or not as you navigate an area? Well, what the game could do is first assign a field of view to the guard that would span some angle. Then to determine whether your character is within that field, the game could calculate the unit normal vector for that guard, which points in the direction they're facing. And then it could create another unit vector going from the guard to your character. After performing the dot product, the resulting angle can be used to find the answer of whether you should be caught or chased or whatever in that moment. And in more general terms, the sign of the dot product tells us whether one player is in front of or behind another character or object. So with just a little vector analysis, the computer is able to mathematically understand what's going on within a game. But within entertainment, it's not just video games, as the dot product is also used when it comes to animated movies, specifically with the lighting and shadows. When you watch modern animated movies, all the shadows that you see aren't manually input by the animators. Instead, the physics of light is programmed into the software. Then they just need a light source, and the scene is lit according to those laws and equations. The one equation that really stands out when you look into this field is the rendering equation. And as scary as it looks, I was surprised to see just how understandable it is. So what does this tell us? And for the purpose of this video, why does the dot product show up? Well, first as a general overview, in the physical world, light comes from some source, like the sun or a light bulb, bounces off objects and into our eyes, which allows us to see it. But it's not just one reflection like this that takes place. Some light will come from the sun, bounce off an object, and lose some energy, then light up some other spot, and then from there bounce into our eyes. So there are many of these reflections that take place, which dissipate the energy of the light each time. See, like, this spot on the tree trunk is not in direct sunlight, 
but it wouldn't be pitch black either because light is bouncing off other objects and illuminating that area. So it will be shaded, but of course you can still see it. Now, when it comes to the movies, the animators have to create some 3D scene, like a house and balloons, a room of toys, or a tree and some rocks on a sunny day. There must also be a light source, whether on the screen or not. And then we, the viewers, are watching all of this on a 2D screen. Maybe we're supposed to see things from this left side. So now all we have to do is figure out the color of every pixel on that screen. And that's what we're going to see. So let's find what the color of this pixel should be from the rendering equation. First thing we're going to do is shoot a ray from our eye through that pixel into the scene and see what we hit first. In this case, we hit the tree. That point we're going to call x, and the vector going from there back to our eye is omega naught. Those are the letters you see up here in the equation. An L naught of that stuff is what we want to find. That's the color, or really the radiance, coming from point x in the direction omega naught through that pixel. Our goal is finding that value, and we're going to use the right hand side to do so. Now this first expression, L sub E of x and omega naught, is the light created by that point x. If that point were a light source, such as the sun, then it would be non-zero. But a tree itself is not a source of light, thus this L sub E value is zero in this case. But that doesn't mean our pixel is black, because we have to look at all the light that would be coming from around the scene, and that's our next term. What we're going to do visually is send out vectors in all directions from that point x to see what might be lighting it up. Those vectors will be labeled omega i, which you'll see all over this right hand side of the equation. So let's look at one of those omega i vectors that hits an actual light source. Since there is light coming from this direction towards point x, then this value of l sub i here will be non-zero. This expression is the light going towards point x from one of the omega i's, so this is our first real contribution to what the pixel color should be. Now moving to the next part, this function here is simply how much light coming from the direction of omega i will be reflected off of point x and head back towards the camera or our eye. If that surface were a mirror, it would reflect a lot of light, and this value would be larger compared to a rock or a leaf, let's say, where more light will be absorbed. And finally, this part here is the omega i vector dot the normal vector to the surface at point x. This is called the weakening factor because the lighting is most intense when the source is shining directly onto the object. Or another way to put it, when the angle between the omega i and normal vector is zero. See, if the sun were here where that angle is zero, then the radiance and the dot product would be a maximum. This happens because the vectors are directly on top of one another and we have direct sunlight. But as the angle increases and approaches 90 degrees, then the radiance goes to zero because the light is basically being spread out along the surface that it hits. And from here, all we have to do is add up all the incoming light from all of those omega i's, which is what the integral tells us to do. So that's the idea behind the rendering equation. The only thing I didn't mention is that you keep doing this over and over as many times as you can afford to computationally because, like we said before, light will go through many reflections. We do shoot that single ray through the pixel, we shoot out more from that point x, but then we keep going, shooting out more rays from all those other points until you have a complete picture of how that scene should be lit. And here's the equation explained all in one picture if you want to give that a read. Now, one completely separate topic I wanted to briefly include in this video is that of plagiarism, more specifically something called document distance. This comes straight from an MIT lecture on algorithms that I just found to be interesting. So how could we mathematically determine how similar two documents are and whether maybe plagiarism has occurred by using the dot product? 
Now the comparison made in the lecture, just to simplify things, was to find the similarity between a paper with the words the dog and another that says the cat. There are three different words here in total. So to find the document distance, this method creates three axes where each represents one of the words. And there can only be integer values for each word or how often they show up. So the first document, the dog, would be represented with this point, one for the, one for dog, and zero for cat. Then I can actually create a vector from there. The next document, the cat, would be here, one for the and one for cat, which I can also connect with a vector. Now we have a vector representation of the documents, so finding how similar the documents are is really just about finding how similar the vectors are, which we know comes down to the dot product. Really here we're just finding the angle between the vectors, but still doing so involves the dot product equation. In reality, the documents would have hundreds or thousands of words, so this would become a higher dimensional problem, which isn't a big issue since the dot product equation extends to higher dimensions. This method probably isn't really used for real world plagiarism algorithms, but still I thought the way a document of words can be transformed into a vector was pretty cool and fit well with this video. And while there are several other equations in which the dot product shows up, I'm not going to go any further in this video. However, if you'd like to dive deeper into this and similar topics, Brilliant has a relatively new linear algebra course where you can do just that. This course is pretty much only focused on the applications of matrices and linear algebra, and the topics go well beyond what you'd learn in a first year linear algebra course. Like this includes how matrices are used in image compression, or there's the applications within cryptography and how ciphertexts are created and decrypted via linear algebra. This course even includes tensors, so I'm sure a lot of you would learn something new from what they have here. But even if you haven't been exposed to much linear algebra, they do have other courses that start at the basics to give you the necessary foundations. And since all of these come with intuitive animations and constant practice problems, it's a great way to really get a grasp on these more advanced topics in math, science, and engineering. Then the first 200 people to sign up by using the link below or by going to brilliant.org slash zackstar will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.